Hi, everyone. Welcome to Dive In The Podcast, your favorite podcast about all types of diving, scuba, tech, freediving, and more. We cover it all. Every week on Monday, we post new episodes filled with diving news, interesting dive topics, environmentalism, and much more. This week, we're talking about freediving. We'll talk to the president of the Halifax Freediving Club about his path to becoming a freediver and creating the dive club itself one of the largest free diving organizations in Canada. Before that, we have some possibly disturbing news about diving after the coronavirus. We'll chat about carpooling in our Think Blue segment. We'll check in 10 years after the Deepwater Horizon spill. This week's book recommendation is one you can actually purchase. <laughs> and as always, April will have a dive safety tip and we'll learn who we should follow on social media next. Before we get started, let me introduce you to our hosts. Nicholas Winkler, thanks for being here tonight. Hey, it's great to be back. Uh, longest surface interval ever, but uh, happy to be podcasting. Wow, well, it just keeps getting longer, eh? Mr. Fisher, Nick Fisher, how are you doing tonight? Doing fantastic. Thanks for having me back, Justin. Excellent. And uh, April, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm uh, doing this podcast tonight from my floor because Nick Fisher has my, my desk and chair. It is a great desk and chair. <laughs> Why does Nick Fisher have your desk and chair? Well, I have some big news. I'm moving to Ontario. It's oh pretty my unique. god! I know, I know. I uh, it's what? it was unexpected, but I got a job offer, and I decided to seize the day and take it. So I'm off, but I'm still going to be hosting and tuning in with you guys every week. So I'll be coming in from Ontario with all that Ontario scuba news every week. Live from Tobermory. <laughs> exactly from dive sites around canada it's yeah. dive in the podcast. lakes and more lakes i know i'm gonna be a lake diver i don't know how welcome to the club that. another lake diver <laughs> we're going in opposite directions you and i april from the I from know. the lakes in the in ontario out to the coast <laughs> and you're going from the coast into the into the lakes of ontario it's great i I don't know what I'm doing, but here we are, <laughs> doing a yep. podcast from the floor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure you'll have a few more weeks of that as you get settled in in Ontario, and we wish you good luck. As they say, fortune favors the bold, and I'm sure you'll uh, have uh, exciting times there. Yeah, I'll give my uh, I'll be tuning in with you guys next week from quarantine, so I'll let you know how that's going. <laughs> right, you're going to be moving provinces, so you're going to be locked up for two weeks. Well, at least we know we'll exactly. have you on the show for the next two weeks. <laughs> yeah, at very feel least. free to zoom me whenever you want. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Speaking of uh, isolating yourself and uh, the importance of uh, of trying to minimize or even not being in contact with anybody having COVID-19, uh, there's some interesting news, which uh, if accurate, um, could affect a great many divers. There is a doctor, uh, Dr. Frank Hartig. Uh, he heads the emergency department in the city of Innsbruck in Austria. He wrote an article in the German diving magazine, Wet Notes. Uh, there is a link to this article in the show notes, and I suggest everyone listening take a look at this article. It's in German, but your browser should translate it. Basically, Dr. Hartig explains that he's not a COVID expert and nobody really is at this point. So take what he says with a grain of salt. No trials were performed, no blind studies, no peer-reviewed journal articles were written. And for that matter, nobody on this podcast is a, uh, is a doctor either. So before making any decisions about your medical health or safety, consult your actual doc. He found that among his many COVID patients, there were... Uh, pretty severe lung changes, even with patients who had little to no symptoms. He says uh, patients who walked in had CT scans of their, their lungs that were just brutal looking. And under normal circumstances, people wouldn't even really notice these lung changes, but under light exercise, they could experience a drop in blood oxygen levels. In those patients, he had six scuba divers and they all came back for a post-virus visit uh, five to six weeks uh, after being diagnosed uh, to be cleared for diving. And he could not clear a single one of them. Uh, all of them had uh, lung conditions still, despite being healthy or seeming healthy to uh, visually, he didn't know when or if they may be cleared for diving again. So we're not trying to be alarmist on the podcast here. And I'm certainly not handing out any medical advice here, but I know when this is all over, I'll be treading very carefully when I decide to reenter the water. I think it's uh, it's kind of interesting because we're you know everybody's navigating this whole COVID thing 
you know, like it's a new thing. And, uh, you know, the article was pretty clear in saying that, you know, this isn't definitive and this is just kind of anecdotal evidence. Mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting from a science perspective because science is learning as it as it as this thing progresses. And it reminds me of a a really um, funny clip from Irish comedian Dara O'Brien. Mm. who basically says science uh, if it knew everything it would just stop and uh, <laughs> so we're just kind of learning and uh, i think it yeah it kind of speaks back to you know stay home stay safe and if you do get sick from covid uh, make sure you get cleared by by proper uh, diving physician if you go mm-hmm. back diving definitely well i hope uh traveling you know i don't get covid and i get in this situation <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I am flying on Friday, but as of right now, there's eight of us on the flight, so mm. should be uh, should be easy enough to social distance on the airplane. Yeah, I've got my mask and my gloves ready, so <laughs> don't uh, don't have any drinks or snacks. Just pass. No. I think it's also interesting um, with that uh, point of it's it's still really early with um, all the research being done mm-hmm. with COVID, yes. um, especially with um, the aftermath or the effects that it it still has on people after they've been diagnosed and then you know cleared of of the virus. What sort of effects it leaves behind, and an an early diagnosis um, of you know not being able to be cleared. Um, I'm, tr- I'm trying to put some sort of, you know, positive spin on this that, uh, <laughs> you know, although it's early, um, a doctor may not be willing to sign off right away if they're not sure. Yeah. So even if there is some minor damage or it looks like some, there's some minor complications, um, mm-hmm. they're not going to put their, you know, medical license on the line to say, oh yeah, sure, go, go diving. Why not? Um, when they don't know. So a yeah. hard no is far easier than a tentative yes and for them. So it'll be really interesting to follow this as it goes along and see how this affects people in the long run. Yeah, def- we'll definitely be following along and we'll, uh, we'll update you guys, uh, listeners out there, if we hear any further on this subject. We're going to move on to our feature uh, feature segment uh, this week. He's the president of the Halifax Freediving Club. And now as it approaches its second anniversary, Nick Winkler spoke with him about why he got into freediving and what it's like bringing freediving to Nova Scotia in a substantial way. Up next, we speak to Jared Kluchier. So Jared, tell me uh, a little bit about, you, about yourself and how you got started in freediving. Uh, I first got started into freediving through scuba diving. So in 2015, I took my open water course uh, and joined the local dive club, the Sea Wolves, and just spent like the whole summer diving, scuba diving. Really enjoyed it, but I found the gear was really bulky and it was really annoying to have to put it all on and there wasn't so much skill involved. So I wanted to find something that would challenge myself a little bit more and you see all sorts of fantastic videos on YouTube and Facebook about free diving and it just made it look so fantastic, like visiting another world with just holding your breath. So <clears throat> I started to dabble in that a little bit. Uh, I didn't know the dangers of everything and by doing it by myself and untrained. And I went on a family trip to BC and there was actually a dive shop that had a course in on. So uh, that's where I met Roberta. Uh, she's currently president of Ada Canada and uh, she was able to put on a quick short notice course for me to get my Ada one certification and teach me how to free dive properly and safely and that I should never be doing it alone. And then when I came back home, I was like, well, I want to do this, I got to do it safely. And that's when I started searching for other people in the province that freed of. And just for the listeners, ADA is the International Association for the Development of Apnea. So you, you went out of BC, did a course, came back. And I guess after that, you were looking for some people to free dive with. Um, because one, one of the things we were talking about, about getting you on the podcast was, you know, you, you're you're the guy that started this, this community. Um, I, I know back in 2012, there was like the... Atlantic Freediving Society, I think, was registered with uh, Marc Andre Tremblay, um, but that I, I guess that didn't really stick. So what? So you started this. So how how'd you get how'd you get going there? Uh, the main thing was was just being consistent. 
actually Raina, the Halifax mermaid, she got in contact with me through Ada Canada because she was looking for somebody to train with. And that's when we started uh, training at a pool. Uh, and then we started the Facebook group to see if there were other people that wanted to join in with training. We slowly over the course of a couple of years got enough people together and that's when we were able to reach out to Ada Canada again and actually have instructors flown down from Montreal to put on the first freediving course in Nova Scotia. That was, I believe, 2018 or 2017 in October. So it's it's been a couple of years now. So there was, I believe, eight of us on the course. So it was a full course and they did the PADI level one for us. Uh, they were able to instruct us in Ada or Paddy, but because we have the dive shops here are all Paddy certified, it made more sense to go with the Paddy certification here versus the Ada instruction. So everybody got certified, and then you decided you were going to start a club. Tell, tell me a bit more about that and why you decided to do that. Because at this point, we tried to start to get formally to become a club, and that's when the pool started to shut down. Uh, breath holding activities in their facilities because there was a lot of information going around in the pool communities that freediving is dangerous and when done incorrectly it can be but because we were trying to go about things the proper way it made the pools scared so they just shut down everything related to freediving and breath holding so at that point I knew it was going to be an uphill battle but in order for something to gain traction it needs to be organized and recognized and then after that then there's no real stopping things any group of friends can go snorkel and pseudo free dive or get their certification and free dive and you know when they're done that's it that little group uh, if they go their separate ways there's nothing to keep it going but if you have a club or a nonprofit group or something where you can actually trade off roles and when people are finished with their adventure in the sport, then they can hand off the role to somebody else and it can keep going from that way. So all the legwork that people have done in the past, it keeps the momentum going. So I figured that would be the best route to keep things alive and to keep things safe because the sport is only growing and I could tell that was going to happen. And in order for things to be done safely, you need an organized avenue for people to take. So what's that experience been like to start to start up the club? Uh, it's been a very long uh, and difficult road. Uh, there's a lot of organization involved, uh, a lot of getting people together. A lot of people have very tight and stringent schedules, so it's very hard to get people together all at the same time for the most part. Freediving is still a very small and new sport, so it's not a huge uh, group base. So the numbers aren't as high as what it would be to make it run more efficiently, more hands make less work. What was the next challenge for the club? Uh, the next challenge was actually having an instructor in the province. So when you came in, you came in at a very pinnacle point. Uh, it was probably going to be a make or break because you can't have a club that advocates safe freediving through education without having some form of courses or education that people can take. So having an instructor in the province is huge. It creates an avenue for people to be able to get themselves educated to free dive safely. Getting a group of people together to have instructors flown in is one possibility, but it takes a lot more time and effort. And in organizing that, you're likely to have people drop out or the times don't match up. So it's not as effective for the growth of the sport or the club. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I mean, I don't want to take all the credit. There's also Han Shen here now as an instructor, so we we got two locally here on the ground. Um, I mean, the other challenge was also trying to get back into the pool, right? Because in order to free dive all year long, you kind of have to keep members occupied in the winter. Can you tell me a little bit about the challenges uh, of trying to get back into free diving in the pools? Uh, getting into the pools was a bit of a challenge. The more centrally located ones, they didn't want to have anything to do with free diving. They just wanted to keep going with their status quo of regular daily activities. They didn't want to have to risk the venture of letting this new evolving sport use their facilities. So we had to 
campaign and come up with strategies to approach pools so that they wouldn't say no immediately or get frightened off. We did get access to the need hand pool about a year and a half ago, which was fantastic. It was the first pool that let us actually free dive in. Uh, the pool itself was not ideal because it's more of a smaller recreational pool. So it's not very deep and it's not very big, but it served the purpose until we could get access to the Dartmouth Zatzman Sportsplex, which was fantastic because they actually have a competition pool. So we can actually do the pool disciplines without any sort of modifications and being able to use a well-established centralized pool like that gives a little bit more visibility to the sport and to the club because then you have people that are there just for like their regular swims or for the open swim and they look over and they see us renting two lanes and we're doing our activities and like, oh, that's kind of cool. There's actually a sports facility that lets uh, free diving in and there's an organized club for free diving. So if I ever want to get into it, there's a place to actually turn to. To, to inform our listeners a little bit, um, obviously there's still a lot of breath holding activities that take place in the pools. You know, um, you know, synchronized swimming and that sort of thing that really aren't as strictly regulated or enforced as, as free diving. Um, I know as a club we put in a lot of uh, measures in place um, in terms of safety plans and training different people. Um, do you want to maybe talk a little bit about all the safety measures that we've put together to, to ensure that we're holding the sport to the highest standard? Yeah, so for the safety part of things, it's right in the club's mandate that that is number one. So to free dive, you have to have passed a certified course. That means that you've attained a minimum level of uh, rescue skills and you have the information and knowledge about the sport so that you can dive uh, safely and informed. So all of our members partaking in apnea events have to have that certification. Then we have more senior members that are actually trained in uh, administering O2 and first aid and CPR. So they're present for club activities. So in the event that uh, an emergency arises, we have the training and the equipment for handling those situations. We have emergency action plans that those members have read and follow in the event that things happen. Uh, and when we're training in the pool, then there's also the additional safety of the lifeguards and their procedures and training as well. So now, now that you've laid all the groundwork, you know, you're really the guy that sort of took the lead on this and, and helped put all the groundwork in for Free Diving Club in Nova Scotia. Can you tell me a little bit about what that has meant for the community and how the community has grown? It's grown quite a lot, actually. If people weren't interested in it, uh, obviously, it never would have taken off the ground. So it gives people a better connection with the ocean and the environment and the community, plus discovering their own capabilities and pushing their own limits. So you get a lot of people that want to self-improve and also look after the environment as a whole. So it's really developed into a large community of great individuals who not only want to better themselves, but the environment and the their community as a whole. So you have people that mostly just want to free dive, not really for depth or records or numbers or anything, but to get closer closer to uh, to nature, to the fish. You have people that want to do it more for physical activity, uh, to better their own personal limits and to push themselves. And then you get people that want to do a little bit of both. And then there's a really big social aspect of it too. When we first started training after our pool nights, we would go to a local sushi area, sushi restaurant, and everybody would just sit down, enjoy a meal together and chit chat and have a great time. So it's really grown as a, a group of friends who care about each other and what they do in the environment. That's awesome. I mean, you, you really deserve the credit for having taken that and, and going running with it, really. So good on you. And, and thanks for bringing that community together. Otherwise, we'd just be a bunch of freedivers kind of randomly freediving about the place, hoping to bump into one another. So, so the club uh, is about to have its second AGM. Where do you see the club going in the future? I see it growing steadily over time, uh, provided that we can get everybody to keep putting in a little bit of time and effort. Now that the club is established, a lot of the one-time challenges that we've had to face, like finding a pool, 
uh, establishing the clubs, bylaws, and all the, the running aspect of everything. Now that all that is mostly taken care of, we can start focusing on other things like actual really fun activities. So we've been talking with other freedivers across Canada, and they're all itching to come play in Canada's ocean playground. Uh, and they really would like the club and the freedivers here to put together sort of like a dive vacation. So two to four day sort of dive retreat, our favorite areas that we like to go to and just sort of set it up so that they can come for a weekend in the summertime, dive Nova Scotia's water, hang out with all the, the local free divers, and then maybe make it into an annual thing each year. That's something that we've gotten a lot of interest in. Uh, last year, we did our first HMCS Saguenay dive. So it was the first boat charter dive. That was awesome. That we did. And it was a huge success. We had, uh, I believe, 16 people turn out for it. Uh, not everybody that turned out for it free dives regularly with the club, but they are members. So it's a great way to sort of extend an invitation to all the free divers in the area because it was a big event. Uh, as far as we knew, it was the first time people free dove the Saguenay until we found out that the, the boat captain, Bill, did a little bit of free dive in there years ago to uh, scare a couple of the scuba divers. So we can't claim the <laughs> first, but we can claim the first organized dive free dive on the charter so that's something we can explore in the future as well uh, we would like to be able to hold sanctioned competitions because that would be a great way to get people to train year-round in the pools because then we can actually give an ends to the means for training all year round besides the the improvement in skill but a chance to push yourself gain records and be a record holder for the province Talking about competitions and records, um, I believe we have a few members from the club that have competed. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about competition and, and some of the records that a club holds? Uh, we do have uh, a few members that have provincial records. Uh, I believe Annie and Tara both have records for pool discipline and depth. Henshan has a dynamic bifins record. Uh, I have a dynamic no fins record. You yourself have quite a few records under the Granada flag, and I and I guess I guess, yeah I guess we can't forget Marc Andre Tremblay, who yep. I think holds um, the constant weight no fins at twenty five and the constant weight at thirty three. Yes. I mean the, these are these are before the club, right? But we still recognize his contribution to to Nova Scotia records. Yeah, he's been holding those records steady for well, that was two thousand twelve, so about eight years. So. Uh, this summer, with the way the situation's going with the pandemic, uh, I don't know if they'll be able to hold a competition or not, but uh, I know there are a couple of members who are eager to beat those records and have their name on the, the scoreboard. So what would you say to somebody that's uh, interested in freediving or has, is, is based in Nova Scotia, is already a free, uh, certified freediver, is just visiting the, the province and they, they want to go freediving? What, what, what does a freediving club have to offer them? Uh, I would say that's fantastic. The freediving club is a great way for people to meet each other to go out and freedive because the number one rule is to never freedive alone. So you need a, a larger group of people to be able to fit your schedule and their schedules to actually coordinate times to go out and dive. And the more people that you know, the more locations that they probably know of. And you can find some really cool areas to dive you can pick up on a little trick that you might not have thought, a different way to equalize. Maybe they have a new piece of gear that works better than what you have and it gives you an idea of what you want. Like there's the more people you know in the sport, the better your chances are for improving your own skill and for finding cool new friends and cool new dive locations. Awesome. So one quick last question because I just thought of it. So what's your favorite dive site and why? Ooh, my favorite dive site. I always do enjoy Herring Cove just because it's really quick to get there. It's the first dive site that I made it to 10 meters. Um, you can just jump right in and swim about 50 feet. Down you go and it's a nice sandy bottom. The bottom changes. Sometimes there's a lot of lobsters. Sometimes there's a lot of flounders. Other times it's just more in the winter time it's just cold and clear and you can see a little bit more uh it's really close to halifax so it's not too long of a drive it's just 
an overall a really good first beginner's site. So that's probably why I enjoy it the most. All right, Jared, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us on the on the podcast here. But um, before you go, did you want to give a shout out to anyone? Uh, absolutely. It takes a lot of people to make a club function. Uh, I want to give a shout out to everyone who's on the board, who participates in making all of our events happen and our regular training to everybody who's been on the board in the past, to to all the, the members, because you can't do it without members, and to all of our instructors. Uh, it's really important that we have them around so we wouldn't be able to be where we are without them. And to, I guess, Ada Canada and all the freedivers across Canada for giving all their time and effort and advice in helping form the club. Yeah, it's certainly become a really amazing community across across the country. So yeah, I just want to say thank you for joining us and uh, taking time to tell us a little bit more about the Freediving Club and, and this amazing thing that you've built here in the, in the province. So thank you very much for coming. No problem. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to take a second to thank our sponsor, Torpedo Rays Scuba. Torpedo Rays is a local dive shop in Nova Scotia. If you're not in Nova Scotia, that's okay. They've got a wonderful website, torpedorays.com, T-O-R-P-E-D-O-R-A-Y-S.com. All of the scuba gear you could ever need is there. If you can't find it, give Jason a call, 902-481-0444, and he'll be happy to help you out. In these challenging times, it's always great to shop local. Don't go to a huge, big box help support your local dive shop buy something you've had your eye on excellent time to make a good deal buy a gift certificate to use later whatever the case may be torpedo rays and torpedo rays.com will be there for you once again their number is 902-481-0444 or torpedo rays.com Nick, thank you for interviewing Jared there. That was a good interview. I uh, learned some stuff. I thought I knew everything about Jared and his path to freediving, but I, I had no clue that he got trained by Roberta. Funny, uh, funny the stuff you don't know. I think it's also cool to put on record, um, you know, what, you know, the, with this podcast, I know, I know the freediving club has done some media stuff, but also to put on mm-hmm. record the story of how the club started and, and what it signifies for not just the freediving community, but, the, you know, general ocean um enthusiasts in the province and you know canada's ocean playground what what that opens up for people to explore the ocean around the coast here speaking of uh, exploring around the coast uh you've got a uh, think blue topic this week yeah so today's think blue segment it's a it's a little eco-friendly tip about how you get to your dive site right um so today we're talking about carpooling and it seems a little bit of an odd choice because you know why would carpooling be an issue? You know, it's it's a thing that that we do here, um, especially on on the coast here to to go diving. We drive to our dive sites, um, and there's many other places where people um, are commuting to get to a dive site. So, how you get to your your dive site by driving and doing it by carpooling is something worth considering. Climate change has massive implications for the health of the oceans, um, from everything from warmer oceans to sea level rise, ocean acidification, coral bleaching. Um, and it all kind of ties in together. According to a 2019 Globe and Mail article um, in Canada, light duty vehicles, that is cars, um, make up half of the carbon dioxide emissions from transportation. Uh, and that's four times as much as domestic travel. So driving around has an impact. Um, and anthropogenetic CO2 emissions uh, being the major contributor to, to climate change. So as divers, we can reduce this impact by carpooling. Uh, you can minimize the number of cars you use to get to a dive site, which is also good if you if you go to a dive site that has limited parking spaces or in some places you might be parking, you know, you, you start eroding like this, this side of the road or some vegetation and you start messing up um, part, of, part of the dive site itself. So less cars uh, means less trips, means easier parking for everybody. And you can also, you know, if, if you're choosing, you can use a smaller vehicle to do so. Uh, so smaller, lighter vehicles obviously use less fuel and they're more more efficient, so less um, emissions. Carpooling is also more sociable, right? This is obviously a post-pandemic tip, but you know when you get when you get together, you meet up at a dive shop or you meet up in a parking lot, you get together in a car and you get to talk about you know catch up with your friends and on the way back you get to talk about diving and it's something for the free diving club actually that we found really useful. A lot of the members didn't have cars. Uh, and we are a really big carpooling culture. So it means people that are students or people who don't have cars get to join in the activities and they don't get left behind when we go somewhere down the coast. So that's also really good. 
the other thing that scuba divers tend to have is a lot of gear, a lot of tanks, a lot of weights. Uh, if you take those out when you're not driving around all week long, uh, it might not seem like much, but that extra load it takes fuel to move the car. It takes fuel to move that load. Uh, and if you're driving 365 days a year with tanks and 50 pounds of lead in the back of your car, that adds up, right? If everybody's doing that. So one of the simple things you can do is carpool and take all your gear out when you're not using it. Also minimizes the risk of having it stolen. So there's all sorts of pluses. So divers should consider carpooling. It's environmentally friendly. It uses less gas and you get to be sociable along the way. Thank you for that, Nick. Uh, let's go over to uh, Nick on uh, this week's rotating segment. You've got uh, kind of a mix between historical events and uh, future research. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this week um, on our rotating segment, I'll be talking about um, the Deepwater Horizon uh, incident, which happened 10 years ago, almost to the date which was a major environmental disaster, but after 10 years has led scientists to uh, conduct some further research on the effects of oil pollution um, following the disaster to study the extent of the damage in both shallow areas and also on uh, deep water environments like deep water uh, sea corals. And it's just sort of interesting um, to see how natural disasters or environmental disasters such as the Deepwater Horizon um, also give... Uh, you know, research an opportunity to study how pollution um, on a large scale uh, is affecting wildlife and also to see how um, wild wildlife has an ability to combat these influences and sort of bounce back. Um, climate change and human influence abs are absolutely a huge uh, cause for concern um, on the environment. So it's important to take these opportunities, even though they are natural disasters, to study nature's ability to combat human influence. What uh, what are your guys' thoughts on on these disasters and the research that comes out of them? You know, I always think this is a huge like double edged sword. Um, I mean, I was I lived in the U.S. Uh, when Deepwater Horizon happened, and uh, it was just I'm, it was bru so brutal. I mean, I'm sure everywhere in the world heard about it, but it was close to home for me. Shortly after. You know, you hear these miraculous stories about, um, you know, about the oil being broken down by certain bacteria in the water and things making an incredible recovery. And, you know, there's these earth finds a way kind of thing. Nature finds a way kind of things. And those are really fantastic uh, and amazing. But it also gives the people that are kind of the naysayers and the deniers a card. And they go, well, look, I mean, when this one thing, miserable thing happened... So it's uh, it's both uh, obviously something we need to study, but man, it really kind of frustrates me at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of interesting because there's um, there's some recent work that suggests that you know the extent of the spill was probably thirty percent larger than it was originally estimated, mm. um, and this is ten years on, right? So um, it's a little bit like you know the pandemic is giving us an opportunity to study all sorts of interesting things in terms of travel and tourism and the economy and like the reduction in, in carbon emissions and things like that, but it's a really, really brutal way to, to go about doing a study. It gives us an incredible opportunity to do these things, but it's, it's I, I don't know if the benefits outweigh through the, the downsides. <laughs> right. yeah. And one one part of the uh, study that we'll we'll link to um, in the description, they they touch on that although it is only you know ten years after the disaster, the research is still open ended. Um, there isn't any definitive conclusion on you know whether um, the environment is kind of bouncing back if microorganisms are able to break down uh, the oil that's contaminated you know all the way down into uh, you know deep water corals and affecting far beyond just the um, initial proximity of the of the disaster. So it'll be again interesting to see how how things mm -hmm. develop over time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's go back to our other Nick. Uh, <laughs> you have a book recommendation. I hear it's one we can order this week. Uh, you should be able to order it. I should pre preface that. This book is by Jacques Maillol. It's called Homo Delphinus, or The Dolphin Within Man. Uh, Jacques Maillol is considered an iconic contributor to modern freediving, uh, bringing various elements of physiology, spirituality, philosophy, and, and research um, with regards to his connection to the sea. And he really used dolphins as, as a centerpiece, at least philosophically, for, for his... Um, 
for his approach to freediving, uh, drawing many parallels between between man and dolphin. And it's a really big coffee table book format size book. Uh, lots of great images. It's it's written um, some time ago, but it's a really interesting book uh, and a really interesting look into into freediving from a, at a time when the, the sport was really coming into the modern era, so to speak. Um, and it opens the door into the minds of one of the world's most famous freedivers. If anybody has ever seen the the movie uh, the the Big Blue, mm-hmm. it's partly based um, on on Jack Mayall. Um, and he was the first person to dive to 100 meters uh, in 1976, and he did that at the age of 49. So, at a time when people were saying, "Oh, you know, like 50 meters is going to be the deepest you can go, or 60 yeah. meters, and then you're going to crash at a certain depth," and then he went on to do to be the first uh, person to to go to free dive to 100 meters. What's the what's the uh, record now? It's 100, 130 <laughs> meters. Um, this classic freediving book uh, can be a little bit tricky to source. It's not out of print. No, oh, no. Um, but it's worth doing a little bit of search because some of the prices can be ridiculous. And if you actually look on like European Am- Amazon, you might have a better chance because it's by a European publisher. Uh, but yeah, it's a timeless freediving classic. And if you're interested in the sport, and we just talked with Jared about the freediving club. So it's a good recommendation for, for, for freedivers. Yeah, pro tip, if you're ever looking for something on Amazon, you can't quite find it, try some other extensions, uh, .com, .de, .uk, or whatever, and you might find a slightly different selection for those book hunters out there. Uh, April, it's that time of the week. Safety tip, what do you have for us? Time of the week. All right. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so, my safety tip this week for the time of the week is uh, always dive with a knife. We heard in a previous podcast I like to carry three on me at all times. So, this week I'm going to uh, extend that to you guys. And so, always carry a knife on you. It's a really good idea, especially here in Nova Scotia. I guess I'm going to find out about Ontario. But in Nova Scotia, there's a lot of fishermen around here. So, it's uh, pretty common to run into some old lines or nets or anything. So, it's always a really good idea to have something to cut yourself free if you get tangled up. And uh, and pretty common to be able to make a quick hundred bucks uh, unfouling somebody's prop. Yeah, exactly. It's a really good point, too. It's more fun when the prop's actually running. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bigger challenge, that's for sure. <laughs> Better challenge. Ex- expert mode. Uh, I'd charge 200 bucks for that, personally. Yeah, prop on. <laughs> yeah, prop running, 200 bucks. Yeah, fair deal, I think. <laughs> uh, April, who are we following on social media? So this week, my recommendation is Bear Sports. Uh, their handle is just at Bear Sports and Bears, but like Bear Naked Ladies, not like the animal. Um, I'm recommending them <laughs> because they. <laughs> it's the only way I can explain it. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so the uh, the reason I'm recommending them, they are a brand, uh, they are a business. Um, but I actually find that their Instagram is quite interesting. I think they do a really good job at uh, balancing their marketing between kind of content. So not every single post they make uh, is necessarily trying to sell you something. Um, They feature their brand ambassadors a lot, which also kind of gives you some nice little branches of accounts to follow. Um, I enjoy following them a lot. And I think uh, as a, well, you know, since this last podcast, I graduated uh, business school. So I think maybe as a uh, you know, recent business graduate. It's uh, interesting to see how they market. So I do find that a little bit interesting. Well, thank you, April. Thanks for uh, letting us know about that one. I'll have to add that to my uh, to my Instagram follows. Yeah, they're awesome. All right. Well, that does it for today's episode. I'd like to thank my co-hosts, uh, Nick Winkler. Thanks for being here. Uh, to- toss it to somebody else. I'll come back. Sorry. Nick Fisher, thanks for being here. <laughs> Always a pleasure, Justin. Great talking to you. Nick Winkler, thanks for coming. Uh, I didn't actually go anywhere. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've been in quarantine the whole time. As always, it's a pleasure to be in a podcast, and I'd like to wish uh, April all the best on her new venture, and we'll talk to her on the podcast when from another province next time. Yeah, April. 
thank you for uh, spending your one of your last nights in Halifax with us recording this episode and uh, safe travels. And, and we'll my talk. last podcast in Nova Scotia. Wow. Yeah, for now. We'll miss you. So, hmm, we'll miss you guys. It's going to be uh, a big adventure. Some good times. So I guess, too, if anybody has any uh, diving recommendations in Ontario, send them my way. Yeah, reach out. You'll yeah. find out where to uh, contact April in just a second. You can follow the show on Instagram and Facebook with at dive in dot the podcast you can email us at dive in dot the podcast at gmail.com you can follow me at i dive okay april is at april weikert nick winkler is at nicholas winkler photography and nick fisher is at scuba underscore 406 you can find links to everything we mentioned today in our show notes or on our website dive in the podcast dot podbean dot com We'll see you next Monday when we speak with one of my favorite local photographers, Lloyd Bond. This episode of Dive in the Podcast was brought to you by our sponsor, Torpedo Ray Scuba. Head over to your favorite podcast app to like, rate, and subscribe. It's very much appreciated. Thanks for listening.